The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, because it was your will that your Son should bear the pains of the cross for us and thus remove from us the power of the adversary, help us so to remember and give thanks for our Lord's passion that we may receive remission of sins and redemption from everlasting death. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you in this uh, week in which we are closer to the Passion. Uh, in Lent 5, um, you can see that the texts for this Sunday are very much focused on the Passion. In this new dispensation, when we are doing both Old Testament and perhaps Epistle alongside the Gospel readings, um, you can see that, that one of the things we're trying to do is to integrate the lessons. Um, we still very much believe that you should choose the Gospel lesson to preach on, and that, I think, for me, is especially true this Sunday. Mark 10, at least the core of the text, 35 to 45, is just one of the great texts in Mark's Gospel in the entire uh, tradition of the Synoptic Gospels. It has, of course, the great statement on the atonement for the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Just the whole discussion between John and Jesus, excuse me, between Jesus and James and John and the sons of Zebedee is such an important part of the, the whole way in which Jesus deals with the disciples, with the big three, and in, these, in the case of this, the two, James and John. I've actually been talking about this text quite a bit since the first of the year because I've been raising money for my work as a career missionary, and part of that is working in Spain. And of course, one of the sons of Zebedee is Santiago, and I use this text to talk about uh, the nature of the entire Spanish mission and who Santiago is and St. James and that kind of thing. Um, you also have included here, and I would use it as a gospel text, the, the, I think it's the final uh, uh, passion prediction of Jesus in Mark's gospel. So p please preach on the gospel. Having said that, the other two accompanying texts are really great texts. Um, one of them, uh, Jeremiah 31, the, one of them, the Old Testament lesson, is of course the New Covenant, which has all kinds of Eucharistic overtones. So you would be able to connect the Old Testament with the Gospel lesson in terms of how at the Supper the Atonement now is offered in with and under bread and wine. So you have uh, Jesus, you know, wonderful statement about the Atonement in the Gospel, and then you could say that, that Jeremiah is, in a sense, a foretaste of how that covenant is going to be recognized as being fulfilled, not only in Jesus' death, but in the ongoing Eucharists of the church's life. Which brings us to the, uh, the epistle lesson from Hebrews chapter 5. Now, some of you know that I teach Hebrews occasionally, not enough as far as I'm concerned, but this is, of course, an iconic text in the sense that we have, as you'll see when we get to the text, the definition of the high priest and then the application to Christ himself. But let me just offer a couple of resources here. One of the books that I use is this book by Albert Van Oya called The Structure and Message of the Epistle to the Hebrews. It's a wonderful book. It is his outline that is in the text that we're going to be looking at in a minute. But I also find his translation to be very, very literal, refreshing, uh, able to be able to work with you very easily. So I, I, it's a great way to go from the very difficult Greek of Hebrews to a translation that helps you kind of see what the author is doing um, in terms of the way in which we are to understand it in English translation. Of course, we now have at our disposal this wonderful commentary by John Kleinig. Please buy it, use it. Um, I haven't had a chance to use it in class. I'm looking forward to doing it uh, uh, in the coming um, years. But uh, please, the, his title for this is that <clears throat> verse that we have 
um, at the very uh, end there in verse uh, 9, the source of eternal salvation. That is one of kind of the theme statements in Hebrews, and that might be your theme for your whole Sunday, the source of eternal salvation. Um, I will come back later and refer to this, but on page 254, um, John has a really nice section there on reception and application of this text. He talks about it as the epistle reading for Lent 5 in series B and relates it to the gospel lesson in Mark 10. So please avail yourself of John. Okay, having said that, let's get to the text. And um, I won't probably say as much about it because, uh, you know, I, I think it's more uh, a text that you would use as maybe a way of um, illustrating some of the things you want to do in the gospel. But if we come here, I, I, I want to just point out the, the two different sections here. First of all, well, let's, let's just start here with the, the first part. Um, I'm always interested in Hebrews in the, the fact that he has these long sentences and how you kind of untie them. And in this first part, you'll see there's a period here at the end of three and then one here. So in, in this text that we're looking at, we have three sentences. And when we get to the second part of the text, you'll see that five to ten is all one sentence. So please observe that. Um, please also observe, oh, I didn't put it in there. This is a main verb here, so this should be in red. Okay. And here's your other main verb in this first sentence. So there are two main verbs. And then, of course, in this one verse, there's the main verb of lambani. And, and I, I think, you know, the, the main verbs in, um, in the, the text really do matter here. So um, let's, let's look at the, the second part just to see the flow of this. I'll erase this. Let's see how handy I am with this. Okay, here we go. Yeah, baby. All right, here. And in the second part, uh, yeah, we can get it all in there. An application, not quite. Um, yeah, there it is. You have the application to Christ. And here, I want you to observe that um, there are three main verbs, you know. Um, the verb for glory here. And just notice how everything is sort of dependent on that verb. And then we have he learns, and then it happens. So you only have three main verbs, and, and you can see here that it's all one sentence. I break it here because I, I, I think there are two different sort of um, parts here. Here he's obviously quoting the scriptures, and then here he's, he's describing it. And the, 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 the theme verse that I said is so important is this one right here, the cause of an eternal salvation. Uh, please look at John Kleinick's translation. It's actually very close to Van Oya, and I think you'll find it to be really quite refreshing and helpful in that respect. So anyway, um, there are the two sections, and, and you can see that in those two sections, you, you have a very clear kind of typical movement of um, the author to Hebrews in terms of moving from what a, what, a, what a high priest is, in a sense, in the Old Testament and how Christ, and I put it in yellow here, is sort of the fulfillment of that. So having said that, let's now kind of work our way through this text a little bit. Um, first of all, I, I, you can see that that high priest is the subject for, he starts with every high priest. And I put it in purple because it's an high priest in the Old Testament. Well, purple tends to be things that are related more to law or the Old Testament blue is gospel. I mean, it doesn't quite always work as cleanly as that. But um, he starts by saying every high priest who is taken out of men and as I said, this is a main verb, is constituted um, on behalf of men the things to God, 
and, and obviously what we would have to um, um, suggest there is, is, is offered, you know, something is offered. Um, it's constituted on behalf of men for the things that are given over to God, the things given to God, in order that, here's the, the purpose clause, that he might offer both gifts and sacrifices on behalf of men. Okay, and you can see on behalf of men is repeated twice. So there is a substitutionary character to, and remember, these are Old Testament high priests, you know, in defining a high priest. Um, in this definition, it is the offering of gifts and sacrifices on behalf of men. Now, he, he has to qualify it here, what kind of high priest is this? And, and, and this is an infinitive, but it's a very important one um, to, in a sense, to, to curb being, being able, the participle, to curb his emotions um, with the ignorant and those who are in error since he himself is also surrounded, um, we might translate that closed, with weakness. Now, here you can see that clearly in the Old Testament, you know, the high priest is a sinner who, even though he's offering up gifts and sacrifices on behalf of sin, on behalf, uh, uh, did I say this was man? On behalf of sin and on behalf of men. But it's the same thing because men are sinners. He himself is a sinner. And then you can see, same, here, here's another main verb. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's really, in a sense, what, what explains why this is the case. And, of course, for us, it, it's obvious, but it certainly is worth repeating. Um, and is obligated, that is, the high priest... Here's the subject, is obligated. Um, because of it, now that's, that, that, um, that antecedent is a really interesting antecedent. And I'm just looking here in John's comment, uh, commentary to see if he clarifies that. And because of it, no, he too is obliged. I think the it is because he himself is a sinner. Um, I did not look this up, but let me see if I can find it here. The feminine pronoun, autain, refers back to the feminine noun, asthenia, weakness. Okay, good. So, yeah, it's right here. It's the, the most, of, kind of the weakness. And on account of this, he is obligated, just as concerning the people, so also concerning himself. Now, even though this has a little different sense than Hugh Pear, it's in the same ballpark to offer, and you can see, on behalf of sins, and here, Perry Harmaton. So in a way, this simply indicates that, that a high priest from the Old Testament was obligated, because he was a sinner, not only to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people, but on be behalf of himself, because he himself via autain. That really is an important word. His own weakness needs to do that. Um, as I said, verse 4 is a new sentence, and I think the best way uh, to translate that, and I'm just going to read you John's, but then we can go back and look at the text. Moreover, no one takes the honor, so no one takes the honor, and you have to add here, at least John puts it, of being a high priest. Um, no one takes the honor of being high priest for himself. Okay? For himself. Um, but, having been called by God, um, receives the honor, you have to add that, just as also Aaron. And that's not how John translated it. He, said, he translated it, but like Aaron, one called by God receives the honor. 
So just as like Aaron, one called by God receives the honor, okay? So, I mean, you, you can see that he takes Aaron now, and ob- he's the obvious example of the high priest, and how did his high priesthood come into ex- existence? He didn't take the honor for himself, but he was called by God, and that's how he received the honor. Okay, simple argument, simple argument, which even though the, the Greek can sometimes be daunting, the arguments aren't always that difficult at the end of the day. Now, that brings us now to the second part, which is really, in a sense, where all the action is and where we want to probably do our preaching if, in fact, we do preach on the text. Okay, so also Christ. Now, there you can see Christ is, I've highlighted it. I mean, he is obviously the way in which we've moved to this. So also Christ, the Christ, He did not glorify himself, okay? There's your main verb, glorify himself, in order that he might become a high priest. You know, in becoming a high priest, he didn't glorify himself. But the one who spoke to him, and here you can see where where Jesus is, in a sense, being called And that this very important passage from Psalm 2 that occurs everywhere. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Uh, This is something that occurs very early on in the epistle. And it's one of the most cited passages of the Psalms in the New Testament. And then again, another proof text. so, So also in another place he says, And this is that theme that's going to come pounding, pounding, pounding in the the, uh, coming chapters of Hebrews. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And you can see that that Jesus' priesthood is going to be um, uh, kind of parallel to Melchizedek. Now, here's that, that beautiful Greek of the author of Hebrews. He starts with Christ and he ends with Melchizedek to show that they are, in a sense, to be compared and may, in fact, be the same person. And today, you know, today, that's I put it in blue. That's such an important, today, this is happening now. Here's that, that now of salvation. And you can see how the incarnation is, is being, you know, hinted here as being the climax of all of salvation history when Jesus is appointed by the Father, you know, in the citation here from Psalm 2, and then the citation here from Psalm 110, a priest, a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay, now, what's interesting is is this is really talking about Christ. And so the who goes back to Christ, but in a sense takes you to Melchizedek too. So this, this is a continuation. So here's, here's the Old Testament foundation. And now here is, in a sense, the ramifications of that. And, and you can see that this who is a description now of what, who the son is. And you can son, see here that son is contrasted here to son there. Really beautiful stuff. Here, let me erase all this so we can kind of come back to this passage. And, and of course, this passage here with the hoss, with the hoss, I'll use blue here, the hoss is referencing back, as I said, to Christ, who, in the days of his flesh, during his incarnation, and and this this is a difficult passage to translate because the verb, which is in, a, in, a, in the form of a participle, is put at the very end, um, and it's here, having offered. So this has to come forward. He puts it at the end, but in our translations, we put it forward. Having offered petitions and supplications, that's these right here, petitions and supplications, with a loud cry and with tears, with a loud cry and with tears, okay? And now you pick up the middle sign. I'm using John Kleinig's translation here. 
I with tears, to him who was able to save him out of death, to the one who was able to save him out of death. Okay, let me just offer you um, Van Oya's translation here so you can kind of see how he does it a little differently. Um, who, in the days of his flesh, he puts forward, having offered petitions and supplications to the one who was able to save him from death. Whoops. To save him from death. And then he, he does it literally. Um, with strong cries and tears. And then you have this. And having been heard because of his rever rever uh, whoops. Because of his reverence. Now notice the two participles are right next to each other here. Having offered and then having been heard. But this has to be taken up here. That's probably why they're together in the Greek. It's really elegant Greek in many, many ways. So John has, um, and, um, and having been heard as a result of his right reverence, um, though being a son, now, as I said, we're take, coming back to son. You are my son. Today I've begotten you. Okay. Although being a son, and this has an echo of that Galatians text, chapter 4. You know, there's some, obviously, in the early church who thought Paul was the author of this, but here you can see, you know, a, a, maybe a relationship there. So anyway, although being a son learned obedience from what he suffered. So here it is, learned, there's a main verb, learned on behalf of what he suffered the obedience. And having been perfected, been made perfect, uh, I think here you can see this is a reference to the crucifixion. That's where he was made perfect. That's where he offered, coming up, you know, gifts and sacrifice on behalf of sin as the high priest. So having been made perfect became the source, became the source I, I prefer Van Oya here for its literalness. Um, here it is. Um, and having been given fulfillment here, he became for all those who obey him the cause of an eternal salvation. Jo John does it a little different. He puts the... the the, uh, became the source of eternal salvation. There it is, the source. I, I, Vanoya has cause, but source is good. Source of eternal for all who obey him. And then the final uh, um, clauses here, and you can see this participle parallels this participle. So having been made perfect and having been designated by God as high priest, in the order of Melchizedek. And here you can see the, the, the author is doing a little switcheroo here. So you can see here you are a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. But here he changes it to a high priest according to the Melchizedek because it's referencing Christ who is now our new high priest. And he is the cause, the source of an eternal salvation, having been perfected on the cross, learning from his sufferings the obedience. N notice here, and, and I, I don't want to make too much of this, but the obedience here is a, a, a reference to Christ. And here, those of you who know me, I'm a the faithful death on, on you know, the, the, uh, the subjective genitive. This is the faith of Christ, his faithful death on our behalf. There's his obedience. And then that defines us as all who are obedient, okay? And this is, in a way, another way of talking about our faith. To be our faith is to be obedient as Christ was in his faithful death on our behalf, obedient to his Father. All right, there you go. Uh, wonderful text, uh, full of just, I mean, it's, 
I haven't looked at this text in a long time until I had to get ready for this class, this, uh, this podcast. And um, ah, I love Hebrews. It's so beautiful. And uh, you could preach a wonderful Lenten sermon on this text, you know. I, what I would recommend is, is look at John's uh, commentary. And um, in fact, let me just read you real quickly what he says here. Because I think it'll maybe whet your appetite. Just the one paragraph here. Oh, here it is. He says... Hebrews 5, 1 to 10 is set as the epistle reading for Lent 5 in series B. It is associated with Mark 10, 32 to 45, where Jesus tells his disciples about his impending passion in which he would give his life as a ransom for many. The accent in that account is not on what he would do, but on what he would suffer in order to save sinners from eternal death. Taken by itself, 5, 1 to 10 teaches the congregation that their eternal salvation depends entirely on Christ's perfect obedience rather than on their all too inadequate obedience like the high priest Aaron and the high priests of the Old Testament. So, I mean, that could be your sort of jumping off point. But, but you're going to be talking this, 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 this week about the atonement, about the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And you even have a little entrance there to talk about how we participate in that sacrifice. Remember, sacrifice here is, in terms of the Eucharist, is a noun. The sacrifice of Christ is body and blood that was given and shed for us on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. That is what we partake. That is what we participate in. That is the new covenant in his blood. You can make that connection, and I think that really would be a, a fine way to make your ongoing pilgrimage to Jerusalem and to Golgotha and beyond that to an empty tomb for that to be a great blessing for your community of faith.